Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. They're irrepressible, they're unstoppable, they are the vigilant, and this week on the 2080 Thrillcast, we talk to the writer behind The Vigilant Legacy, which is the new issue in this uh, ongoing shared universe based around the IPC archive, Simon Furman, who uh, many people will know from his work on Transformers in the 1980s, and his work for Marvel UK. But this is the universe spanning shared universe, um, which uh, launched last year and uses some of the uh, the many, many, many characters that uh, we inherited from IPC. And uh, it's a pleasure to chat to Simon about uh, the series, about what his plans are for it, how it came together, uh, and what the different elements within the strip are and, and kind of rebooting all these characters alongside Simon Colby, Jake Lynch and Will Sliney. So it's a cracker of an issue and is out now from all good news agents, comic book stores and digitally from our 2000 AD web shop and apps. And in case you haven't seen the announcement, we've uh, announced the schedule of events for the Day of Dread on the 7th of September, a chance to celebrate and explore the legacy of one of the world's most iconic comic book characters. Uh, We've got signings uh, across the UK. We've got signings in the USA. Uh, We've got things happening online. We've got art jams. We've got exhibitions going to be a great day and uh, we hope you will join us at one of these events if you can't join us online as we celebrate the legacy and the future of uh, the greatest lawman of mega city one if you need details go on to 2080.com forward slash news and you'll find all the details there and don't forget, we want to know what you think about the 2080 Thrillcast. Drop us a line on Thrillcast, or one word, at 2080.com. That's Thrillcast at 2080.com. Some good suggestions uh, coming in already from people. Uh, one or two we can't do, but uh, it's lovely to hear what people think. And don't be afraid to leave us a five-star, if you please, uh, review on the podcast app of your choice, whether it's iTunes. We're now on Spotify uh, or any of the others. It's always good to uh, see people appreciate uh, the podcast and it was wonderful to hear at San Diego Comic Con some really nice compliments. So thank you to everybody who dropped by the booth and said nice things to me. I definitely didn't blush. Anyway, let's crack on with the Vigilant Legacy. And uh, it was a pleasure and a privilege as somebody who grew up reading Transformers comics to speak to Simon Furman about bringing back some of the greatest heroes from the legacy of British comics. We didn't have you on the podcast to talk about uh, the first issue of The Vigilant last year. Tell us a little bit about the genesis of the project, because uh, Keith Richardson, uh, the uh, the editor on this, uh, this is a bit of a passion project for him. So tell us how about you came on board and, and it all, all, all sort of came together. Yeah, well, Keith kind of contacted me fairly out of the blue, really, and um, just asked whether I wanted to meet up and talk about, um, you know, an exciting possibility for some work. And obviously I was keen and interested to hear what he had to say. Uh, And and when, you know, it it came out that it was involving the characters I'd kind of grown up reading in, you know, Lion and Buster and all these other comics, it was just that, wow, this is you know, dream project for me. So, you know, so often I've had, you know, the Transformers creators now who say, well, you know, I grew up reading your stuff and so it's a thrill to work on it. I kind of suddenly understood how they felt, you know, <laughs> these were iconic characters to me and, it, and and really they were my sort of, uh, as well as the Marvel comics, they were my staple you know, formative stuff. So all these characters that um, Keith was talking about suddenly were things I I read, knew about. Up in the loft still had, you know, a, a big stack of Lion comics. And so, you know, suddenly over a lunch, we were just talking about 
all these crazy kooky characters that you know a lot of people i suppose maybe had even forgotten about but were still very present for both of us so you know really quickly we just saw that we were both on the same page with things and and keith had kind of come to me because he'd read uh, things like dragon's claws and death's head that i'd done and he liked that sort of slight anarchic feel that they had you know sort of the you know and the very sort of you know action led but characterful as well so you know he he sort of thought i was a rock good fit for it mm. and once we started talking i think we both thought i was a good fit for it just because you know i knew a lot of this stuff going in uh, so uh, tell us a, a little bit about your experience with these characters because um th- we're drawing in uh for the vigilant characters from across i guess the ipc universe if, if we can call it that but to a certain extent quite disparate characters as well because the, the the notion of a shared universe wasn't really something that uh was there originally yeah it did present a challenge because you know obviously something like the steel commando existed not only in a different you know universe but a different time you know space as well um and you know the leopard from lime street didn't have seemed to have much to do with a sort of strange mystical old guy called dr sin and 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 yes you're right they were very disparate elements death wish was very much its own strip you know but you know i've always loved that you know i always loved the connectivity of the marvel universe so doing this to those British characters and and joining some of the dots or saying, well, look, you know, this isn't even the same character, but we're going to take the spirit of that character into a new person with that name, such as Dr. Sin or Thunderbolt, and just make them work together, really. You know, the leopard very much was you know, existed in and around Selbridge. So Mm. we never really saw whether there was a wider world very much with him. So it didn't seem a big leap to say, well, no, these, there were other places with other heroes. And, you know, we rationalized the Steel Commando that he's, you know, he's put on ice for a while after World War Two. And and just generally, it didn't seem as big an ask as we thought it might be to make these characters gel in the same space. That's something I wanted to ask, uh, specifically ask about was rebooting characters, because you, you mentioned uh, the leper from Lime Street there. Uh, Rob Williams had uh, uh, sort of rebooted Doctor Sin. Um, and, uh, um, and made him a, a, a young rapper. <laughs> That's possibly yeah. making me sound about 10 decades older than I actually am. But um, uh, is there a certain degree uh, where you have to be sensitive to what comes before when rebooting a character, when, when placing them t- into, as you say, an environment in which they, they were, were alien to previous? Yeah, I, th- I think we had a sort of balancing act all the way through the vigilant because, you know, these were iconic characters to me and Keith as well. And we didn't want really to want to mess with them. But, you know, some of them just felt like they needed a, a, a more of just a sort of coat of paint, you know. So the leopard maybe just needed aging up a little bit and toughening up a bit and some of the the more sort of goofy aspects of his costume toned down a little bit or made more relevant but other characters like dr sin felt well there wasn't really much of the original dr sin to start with there's it's only a one story that we had so it didn't feel we were tampering too much to make him a grandson and very different in in you know the approach we were taking to him and a lot of that hard work and heavy lifting had already been done when i came on board Mm. it was it was it was good for me just to have that well there it is that's dr sin and i wasn't that familiar with the original so it didn't have any problem with me and making and, and just generally without sort of ticking boxes we did want to make the vigilant a more you know fit for purpose team you know i didn't really it needed to be more balanced british heroes back in the day were fairly white male and that was about it you know with a few exceptions so we did want more of a balance in the team and and it it felt right to take a character like thunderbolt again 
in and say, well, look, this is the original character, but all we're doing is we're taking the watch, which was the sort of MacGuffin, really, that made him Thunderbolt and, and giving it to someone from his his universe so again we stayed true to it we didn't just put a random person you know mary lanson was from that original strip so it it was all done with all the right connectivity to the originals but you know some of them just needed a, a fresh coat of paint whereas someone like blake edmonds just didn't he did is more or less just cross straight over into the vigilant mm. When you're uh, dealing with legacy characters, but you're introducing them to a new audience, and when there's a lot of them as well, I mean, in in this issue of the of the Vigilant, there are eight primary characters. Um, how do you balance people's nostalgic expectations with uh, an audience that probably has never read these characters before? Yeah, it had to be reasonably entry level. I mean, the first issue, the first Vigilant came with a very nice who all these characters are, you know, introduction before you even got into the story, mm. which freed us up a little bit just to launch straight in. Um, but, you know, one of the things we felt, you know, just through space constraints we didn't get to do with the first issue was kind of go behind the mask in the story itself. So we... We, we made space in this next one in legacy to be able just to sort of take our foot off the accelerator a little bit and have a look at some of these people in their uh, quote unquote ordinary lives <laughs> and, and, and give it a bit more context that way so that new readers and old readers get that sense of, oh yeah, these are real characters. They're not just, you know, they're not just the costume. They are, Billy Farmer, they are Blake Edmonds, you know, and and so it gave us a little more room for that. But I think fundamentally we wanted just to say, here they are, you know, it, a, a bunch of not always play well together characters, you know, who are who have been lumped together by someone who doesn't even really sort of feel he knows enough to be in charge of them. So, you know, it felt like a sort of a nice, easy way in that it's a team, but, you know, I think Keith and I always likened it to the defenders mm. where characters may come and go, you know, it was a very loose assemblage rather than something as structured as the Avengers had been in the Marvel universe. So, we just wanted it to keep it flexible so that people can drop out. There are clashes. Sometimes new members are drafted in. You know, it was such a wealth of, of characters to choose from. I think we just wanted that flexibility. Mm. Something you mentioned there uh, really struck a chord because particularly with characters such as the Leopard of Lime Street, and, and you've already mentioned this, but there was a... A localism about them, almost a parochialism. They were very local. They were ordinary. Their lives were uh, not ex extraordinary in of themselves. D is is that something that you've you've tried to in in those moments of quiet try to to, to keep these characters grounded like they were in in the original comics? Yeah, I think so. We always tried with the leopard in the in the first one and this one to sort of suggest that. He's, he's happier just doing what he does on a more local street level basis. You know, I don't think he, I don't think he wants to be part of the vigilant. I think he sees he, he's drafted in, but he doesn't see it as a, he doesn't see himself as a natural fit in a team world shattering threat level group. I think he always sees himself more as still that, somewhat neighborhood crime fighter and and yeah we tried to keep that that vibe going that you know of all of them he's probably the most of a square peg in a round hole that he he doesn't feel comfortable in the team setup he's he doesn't feel comfortable almost with the the sort of you know the mystical magical side of the whole thing you know he's very you know grounded and and so, yeah, we've tried to keep that moving through. And, you know, there's a nice little nod 
to Selbridge and his sort of backstory from the original strip in in this second issue. You've got some fantastic villains to play with because if there's one thing British comics did, uh, it was uh, create these wonderful personalities such as um, uh, Von Hoffman, of course, the, the Nazi scientist who uh, just really liked making big insects to, attra- uh, to attack uh, uh, small British towns, and uh, Dr. Mesmer as well, of course, uh, from Dr. Mesmer's Revenge. Um, is it easy to kind of make them very overblown, almost like kind of uh, 1930s kind of uh, over-the-top villain horror types? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, you know, the the great thing about the you know IPC Fleetway strips is often they would make villains the the title character. You know, mm. it would be their strip. It, you know, there might be someone trying to stop them, but largely it was their story. Von Hoffman, Mesmer, you know, the White Eyes. It was very much about the villains themselves, and I think that was great because it made them the characters rather than just the foil to someone else. And I, I think you know they are larger than life, but you know they're they're still very rooted in the things that they wanted from those strips originally. You know, von Hoffman, you know, he wants immortality, he wants to live forever. Uh, Mesmer is really all about his artifacts and his ancient Egyptian, you know, connections and his, and, and so we wanted that just to be there still. And, you know, we, we, we've subtly linked von Hoffman and Mesmer in the second, in the second issue with a, a kind of suggestion that uh, almost the spur for the whole of, of Dr. Mesmer's revenge is rooted in something that we didn't see at the time and only now is being revealed. And and I think that's something else we keep trying to bring to the vigilant, that we're going to subvert things as well. What, you know, it, yes, we, we're true to the source material, but maybe we didn't see everything back then. Maybe we didn't know everything back then. And, and maybe some of the things that were set up, like in Thunderbolt the Avenger, well, do we know everything about this watch? I mean, it sounded preposterous in the original strip, but maybe that's the point. You know, Alan Moore did it so well with Marvel Man, Miracle Man. You know, the actual early strips, he didn't want to throw them out, but he was aware that for the a 1980s audience, it kind of wouldn't wash as did. So he just turned everything on its head so cleverly. And again, we've tried to do a little of that here and just say, well, yes, that was preposterous because it's not really the case. And so, you know, once we start to learn slightly more about Thunderbolt's watch and what it means, where it comes from in this issue, and and we loop Pete and the little ones into that. So, you know, it's just, again, building that out-of-costume connectivity between the characters there's just so many wonderful gimmicks to uh, the characters from the IPC archive you know Pete's pocket army you've got the the the, the leopard um even sort of the slightly grimmer ones like uh, Blake Edmonds in 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 death wish what's your what's your favorite what 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 would be one of the characters uh, if they're not in the vigilant that you would like to to get your hands on and do something different with Oh, I mean, there's, I mean, you know, obviously this, this second issue starts off with uh, an, a whole other vigilant team. Mm. And, you know, of course it was just like, oh, wow, you know, can we put these characters in? But how do we do that? We've got a very crowded issue, eight members of the team anyway. So we just came up with this whole contrivance of have, there having been um, an original team called the Vigilant, led by the original Doctor Sin, mm. which gave it a nice sense of continuity as well. And everything is then wrapped into this overarching story of the Blood Rapture, that is not a one-off, but is going to keep happening again and again. And they have to keep stopping it. So there's always the need for the Vigilant. But yes, it gave us that opening five pages that Will Sliney drew you know and you know almost stand alone as their own little bit of the issue 
you know, gave us the chance to feature some of these other classic characters like Robot Archie and, um, you know, Tim Kelly of Kelly's Eye. So, you know, these were, again, characters I was just itching to get a hold of and and use. And I hope that as we roll onwards, we can do more featuring those characters, maybe that original Vigilant team. There's a lot to pack into a, a, a few pages, and obviously we, we've we've been doing these as uh, an annual event as opposed to something that, that, that that's monthly. Um, as the 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 writer, what's the pressure to make sure that a people are reminded of what's gone before, but also that those who not necessarily read uh, issue one or or perhaps you know read it a long time ago forgotten what's in it are able to pick up the the narrative thread particularly when you've got so many characters yeah it is tough i mean you know in an ideal world a, a kind of tighter frequency of these things would be brilliant you know because it is a a a continuing story um but yes we so it does create a pressure if you like to make the issues also reasonably self-contained so the first issue had more of the you know the the story was about adam eterno this one is more about the sludge and you know what's going on in in that w sort of strand of the story but laced through it still is this overarching what von hoffman is trying to do achieve leading to this thing called the blood rapture that we're teasing and hinting about but not really explaining in any great detail so it's a tough one you know the frequency of well nearly a year between issues is a tough one to maintain that sense of continuity but you know we're trying as best we can to make it reasonably self-contained but these still will be you know we hope when the next one rolls around three you know make one sort of big chunk of story for you what, what, what's the what's the value in bringing these characters back because um uh, you, you've already mentioned Al alamore's work on 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 miracle man slash uh marvel man and of course he did albion uh, a number of years ago um and even with something like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, he's 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 churning through all these uh, references from from sort of the the well the past hundred years, hundred and fifty years. Um, so, what for you? What what's the value of of not only bringing these characters back, but actually engaging with them again, not not as a kind of throwaway element in a uh, in a in a meta narrative? Yeah, I, I think they're they're sort of fundamental to the whole British side of comics. You know, they are the heritage of this. It, 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 and it, I think they're important and, and important enough not to leave mouldering in a, a filing cabinet or just being the preserve of uh, collected editions for, a, for the people who grew up with them. I, I think they deserve a new audience. They deserve uh, a fresh coat of paint made more relevant. I, and, and just it keeps that going. It says, look, you know, as much as American comics have all this rich history, so do we. And we have our cast of characters and, and making them in interconnected now makes it seem even more cohesive. And I think that's the responsibility. It's to it's to bring in new readers. It's not just to appeal to, you know, the fact the people like me who grew up with the characters, but to make them relevant, make them interesting and just generally say, this is it. This is our, our comics, our British comics heritage. One of the elements that uh, always struck me about uh, the stuff in the archive, and this was mentioned on the, the panel that we did recently at, at San Diego, was um, how working class so many of the stories and so many of the heroes were, e even f into the kind of girls' comics, um strips like bella at the bar which is essentially a story of child abuse um they, they, they as you said they are very grounded um when you're kind of upgrading these characters into a kind of pseudo marvel interconnected universe kind of thing um 
is there a risk that that you can you lose that grounding that you can lose that sense of um the ordinary within the the, the characters themselves and uh, yeah i think there there obviously is that you know a team book is is more difficult to have that um i suppose enough of the the characters themselves you know you, you're dealing when you're dealing with eight different characters it's tough to do more than a little bit of character development a little bit here and we've tried a little bit with uh, legacy to to put them back into their respective worlds and say you know this is what they are like you know they are grounded they are working class they are rooted in the real in, in in a far more real world than sometimes i felt that the american heroes were you know it, it's more i don't know gritty somewhat dark you know and and i i think we've tried to do that a little but you are forever saying that really the story and i think what people will want is you know the the bigger uh sort of grand storyline that's running through it but yeah we do try and pepper that in to keep it rooted if at all possible and so yeah you know often it's just locations you know there's you know the opening battle against the sludge uh happens in birmingham and you know right in the sort of bullring and 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 you know the opening with, with the first vigilant is Salisbury Plain, and it's always I think bringing it back somewhat to you know really recognisable ground level locations, and it helps sort of root the, the fantastical elements more. Because you, you've you've got form with kind of interconnected universes, because of course. Um the Transformers bled into uh, Death's Head, which uh, then uh, kind of bled into uh, Doctor Who at one point. Uh, and then you had uh, uh, the, the kind of Marvel UK interconnected universe. Uh, it's, does each of these circumstances, each of these situations demand sort of different things? So it's not as as easy as just kind of jamming a load of characters together and, and seeing what shakes out is is it just um the way that you uh treat them is kind of based on 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 who they are and what they are so it, there's not a formula to doing a team book is basically what i'm saying yeah i don't think there is and i think you know you know even marvel you know they they they've always sort of done different kinds of team books. And I, you know, I was always a big fan of their defenders idea because the sort of the roster came and went and people drifted off or they were just brought in for an issue. And, and I like that fluidity of it. And I think that's the sort of the more laid back attitude we want to the vigilant, that these characters are called together when they're needed they're not always the same characters each time, you know, other ones are drafted in. And I, th I think it's just that sense of it's a, it's, in a, it's a much wider world than we're even seeing here. And, you know, there were tiny little vignettes in the first issue of more heroes, other characters that Dr. Sin could call upon if need be. And I think it's just I, we didn't want it too sort of rigid we wanted it just this sense that there is a whole world of characters out there that we can maybe draw upon, drop into a vigilant story. So just keeping that framework loose felt that it immediately made it more a sort of bigger universe of characters. Let's talk about the artwork a little bit because you've got uh, Simon Colby, the main artist on the on the strip, but also you're joined in this issue by uh, Jake Lynch, who readers of Joe Dredd will recognise, and Will Sliney, uh, who's uh, better known for his his work uh, uh, for American comics. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. uh, what do you think the different styles? Or first off, um, what's your uh, relationship like with um, Cy Colby? Because you know th this this is a, a, a really a big quite a big undertaking to to reboot these characters to um put them into a, a shared believable universe yeah i mean i know i know Cy colby from from ways back when we you know he drew some of my sort of 
early Transformer stories or certain actually one some of the my later Marvel UK Transformer stories. So, you know, we'd worked together before. We hadn't worked together for a while, but in the nature of the British comics biz, you bump into people. And so, you know, we knew each other well enough. But, you know, with this one, it was very much a case of, you know, I knew his stuff enough to say, well, look, you know, I can take my, I can take sort of no real part in any kind of redesign, rethink for these characters because that's over to you. And and Simon didn't disappoint. You know, he he, he sort of did that nice thing of roughening up the characters a little bit, you know, updating them, sure, but just taking that somewhat, some you know, with the leopard, say, he, he cut away all the, the somewhat silly aspects of the costume and made it more of, of just a sort of purpose-built thing for now. So, you know, I, I just immediately trusted Simon and, and, you know, he hasn't disappointed. So we've had a, a very easy run working together because, you know, with very few exceptions, it, you know, what I write, he draws and he draws it amazingly. So, uh, you know, we've, we've slotted very quickly into a, what I call a, a good sort of, without using that word synergy, a good synergy <laughs> with, when we're working. <laughs> I really like the the, the way that the uh, the leopard's been done because, of course, uh, leopard print is is a form of camouflage, so it kind of makes sense that urban mm. camouflage can evolve in in uh, you know <laughs> a synergistic way with it, kind of thing. I mean, we had a little fun, bit of fun in the in Legacy with the costume because you know Simon with the first issue went quite sort of full on, you know militaristic with it whereas you know we thought that maybe was somewhat removed from that that essential essence of the character we were talking about so we almost made it part of the the plot or issue two that there's something of a falling out over the costume and and a slight tweak to that that puts the leopard in in a slightly more classic outfit. So you know, it it's an evolving process, but it was nice that we could actually make you know some character element out of that. And uh, with the work that uh, Will Sliney has done on on the, the kind of uh, it's like a prequel, really, isn't it? It's, it's dealing with with the, the the previous vigilant, different style altogether. Uh, a lot more. Uh, I suppose you'd say kind of classic superhero style. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I think it was really good. And it was really good. I always think those ones where you're going to do a almost prequel moment set 20 years before to take it out of that art style of the modern day really helps differentiate it. And And I just thought it was really, you know, fun to see a different take on it. And, you know, and... Obviously, the first issue had an assortment of artists doing backup stories, and we only just had the one in this. So in a way, instead of a backup story, we just had a little prequel story, which, if it had been a self-contained thing, would have been a different artist anyway. So it just seemed to work for that. And and I just think Will did a, an amazing job. You know, that that sort of double-page spread is is just amazing. Let's talk about the future because obviously this is an ongoing story, and without giving too many spoilers away about what what, what you're intending, um, what's next for the vigilant? I, I think the you know the next we really want to we don't want to sort of especially if this frequency is is going to be you know anything from six months to a year we don't want to drag things out. So I think very much we're going to get to the blood rapture and bring that to some kind of conclusion you know we uh, you know whether it's over one or two issues we're not quite sure yet but certainly we don't want to just you know it, even if it was a a regular three issue series you'd want some kind of conclusion or four issue series so we are build we don't want to sort of just drag this on and on you know we've been building to this blood rapture and we uh we sort of darn well want to get to it next issue so that's pretty much going to be where we're going but as ever with the vigilant we want there to be more to it than that so you know while we're doing that we we want to seed other storylines you know 
leave certain things open for future st- the stories you know maybe change the roster up a bit you know maybe even bring back the original vigilant team we don't really know what happened to them at the end of uh the prequel so it it's going to be you know interesting to see where we go next but it will reach some kind of conclusion uh within the next sort of issue or two whichever depending on how frequently we can get those out and is there a character from the archive that that you remember or you looked at and you thought this one isn't redeemable we can't. <laughs> you know as, as much as it, it would be interesting to bring them back they, they, there's there's no way to retcon there's no way to reboot um and and, and slot them in yeah, I'm not sure there's any such beast. I think, you know, I think you can look at any of those characters in a modern sense, with a modern sense of anything and say, well, that's a little preposterous. That's, that's you know, I don't think that would work. But the challenge is making that work, making it relevant, making it something it maybe wasn't on the surface back then. So, no, I mean, I think I'd be happy to be handed any assortment of characters and say you know well that's the ones you've got to write about and it would be a a a challenge as far as i would see it to make them you know more than this maybe the sum of their original parts without losing you know the essential something that made them what they were so no you know i think it's any character really it's it's just what you do with them so i'd be happy to say you know, almost absolutely any character, we can do something with that. Because so many of these characters, the, the, at their heart, they're, they're so very simple because you, you had such a turnover of characters um, and, and comic books at the time. You know, the, 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 the archive encompasses hundreds and hundreds of, of, of separate characters, all with their own unique gimmick, their, their, their own unique setting. Um, so I guess, the, the like I said, there, there is a simplicity to them that... that makes it easier to move them around i guess yeah i think so i mean and i think you know we touched upon in the first vigilant the idea of not all of them are happening in this reality that you know something like the esper commandos are a in a parallel world that you know the white eyes hail from another excuse me another earth so i think you know, there's there's ways and means here to say that, you know, yes, we've got our core, you know, again, in that kind of multiverse thing, we've got our core IPC Fleetway archive world, but within that orbit other worlds and and then characters like Adam Eterno can flit completely between those worlds and uh, so I, I think, you know, there's always, the, you know, we've got a demon dimension already. So I think we'll just, if it expands and if we need interconnectivity, sometimes it will be that, well, here's your parallel world. Here's a world where things went in a slightly different fashion or time, you know, the Second World War, for instance, never ended or kept going. I think you could have fun with just exploring some of these other strips in the context of other realities and is there a a character in the vigilant that that you would love to be able to spin off into their own series and do the the kind of solo adventures of them uh probably if i was given carte blanche i would do a little leopard series because (laughs) you know in some ways he's the most solo of the characters but even if we did a leopard series I would I would want to sort of keep him connected to maybe not even the heroes, but you know the real characters like Pete Parker, like Mary Lanson. So it would be a leopard series, but maybe featuring you know the alter egos of 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 some of the the hero characters from the Vigilant. So I I'd want to keep it grounded within so it would be a pure leopard story but still keep that sense of this is a connected universe where these characters do not operate completely in isolation and can turn to each other for help if need be so i think that would be the thing i'd do a leopard series if i could but i would connect it to the vigilant wherever possible Mm. 
Brilliant. And look, looking ahead, uh, you know, we, we've talked about what, what's in store for the vid- Vigilant. If we ever do a, a, a Leopard series, you'd like to spin off and do that. Um, what would you say to, 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 to people who have no connection to these characters, didn't read them uh, when they were younger, um, don't know who they are or their, their legacy? How would you sell something like The Vigilant to them? I would say this is your this is a, a a team you can immediately jump in and and join. You know, it it doesn't require a lot of back knowledge whatsoever. You know, they are a team. They're assembled by a guy who it feels he's burdened with this. You know, his grandfather's legacy. You know, they're very flawed. They're very. Uh, entry level in terms of understanding who these characters are you know the why they come together is the grand overarching story but essentially you are just joining a bunch of characters who are learning to be heroes learning to work together as a team and i think that gives you that sense that you're coming in at a nice early stage and and there's not much to understand they are heroes in their own little patch or they are they live their own lives but every now and then they're drawn together and that's where the story starts you know it's connected to their home lives their pasts everything but the story starts whenever they're summoned together and i think you just get that entry level to the story that you can just join this exciting adventure and and get to know the team as you go along as much as they're getting to know each other every issue to make sure you pick up your copy of the vigilant legacy from all good comic book stores and news agents and thank you to simon for chatting uh, about his work with simon jake and well on uh, what is an absolutely jam-packed issue and i've read it absorbed it can't wait for the next one i'm gonna have to don't forget to help spread the word uh, about uh, the work that we're doing with the old ipc archive whether it's vigilant or whether it's collected editions follow the treasury of british comics online uh, at brit comics on twitter um treasury of british comics on facebook and uh, at brit comics on instagram as well where uh, we don't just dive back into the archive but also let you know about what's coming up in the future The 2080 podcast will be back in two weeks' time, so we will see you then. Thanks again, Earthlets, Blundig Verthwig. Alert, alert, alert. Fill power levels dangerously high. Alert, alert. The 2080 every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2080online.com. Subscribe digitally on our apps for Apple, Android, and Windows 10. And download the RM free copies from 2080online.com. Alert! Alert! Stand by for urgent updates. Search for 2080 on Twitter and Facebook. Watch the latest videos at youtube.com forward slash 2000AD online and follow on Instagram at insta2000AD. Program complete. Shutting down.